are on the air. Let me get over to our show here. Let's start the light bulb. Welcome to Evolution Hour. And uh, the clickety clacks, Troubles in Paradise, Methodology of Creationism. Jackson Weed is here with us today. Ticking clocks and wonderful things. Or WordPress.com. that is our operation. So we will stop sharing. Welcome to the show. We got Jackson here. Let me get our screen. Oh, good. We're back into operation here. You can see his little face down in the in the route there. Ah! Um, busy little times. Um, part one is replacing Darwin, where good old Nathaniel Jensen is getting really vague in the sections of the chapters. Uh, the, for the next couple of weeks, it's going to be weird because he's not really got much documentation for his assertions. Um, he dangles horses. He sort of implies this time that, yeah, horses are all kind of related to their fossil members. It doesn't cite anything. So, yeah, isn't that sweet? Yeah, that, remember, remember, we all know creationists have always accepted transitional forms, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, so anyway, oh, I'll be yeah. putting a link into a previous uh, video that you can basically follow up stuff that uh, were the horsings the prior uh, times that he brought it up. Um, but the big thing that we're going to want to discuss is wonders of Precambrian life and the sponges, because part two it relates to uh, Gunter Beckley. Who put up a posting and we are putting the link up the myth of Precambrian sponges, which is a really quite a long paper with a lot of references in it. I haven't even got all of them plugged in to my uh, data field yet, but at any rate, um, it's looking at every problematic issue about how you find sponges. For those of you who haven't dated a sponge lately, that you might discover that they don't leave a hell of a lot of hard parts except for the little spicule things. So their fossil record is kind of vague. You've got the reefs that the sponges generate. And the question is, were the earliest sponges like that? And did they produce these little spicules? And how can you tell the spicules from little quark shards? And uh, it's been mushed and smushed. And so how easy is it to locate the fossil record of it? And, and so, Admittedly, uh, Beckley does a really detailed breakdown with some interesting omissions of works that are relevant to uh, both the Duchanteau uh, uh, Precambrian sponge embryos. There's debates about how many of those are that way. Oh, Slade. Hello, Slade. Uh, we got our uh, a visitor here in the uh, uh, live chat. And um, the um, fossil record the, of that. Everybody's pretty well certain that you've got definite signs of sponges in the Cambrian. So, ta-da! Isn't that nice? But we don't want any pre-Cambrian sponges now, do we? And what would they look like and how easy would it be to find? So he pulls together all this material. Uh, a lot of the stuff isn't available open access, but I was able to find a really nifty little paper from 2019, which somehow or other Mr. Beckley didn't notice. Uh, early Animal Evolution, a Morphologist's View. Uh, and um, in oh, there, I've there's... i that paper. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, uh, and it's curious that Beckley missed it. Uh, it's got a, a detailed breakdown of the discussion, not only of sponges, that's just a long way, uh, but also um, uh, metazoans in general, how they fit onto things. And uh, so it's got a very nice uh, section on origin and evolution of the periphera, uh, which... Um, uh, he uh, discusses his own model uh, from uh, 2008 that uh, presents a continuous series of evolutionary stages based on changes in structure and function. Uh, the theory explains how an advanced uh, uh, choanoblasty settled by an area of unciliated cells and organized the choanocytes in a groove, and how this groove became transformed into a choanocyte chamber. This was the ancestral sponge, which with increasing body size developed lower choanocyte chambers organized in an aquiferous system. Uh, that sounds really like detailed because it is. The technical paper itself goes into quite, uh, um, I don't think this is open access yet, but you may be able to find it online. The point is, is that wasn't discussed by Beckley either. And Jackson has read the paper as well that Beckley did. 
And the thing that I'm sure we will have common agreement on is the one thing that we don't get in Beckley's discussion of sponges is what Beckley thinks sponges were. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's not just with sponges either. He wrote that other paper we looked at, which involved. Uh, uh, we looked at the other paper that he wrote, which uh, Kimberelia and things. Um, uh, I uh, think of the one with Namakalathus, I think. Mm. No, uh, the, no, the Claudinids. That's what it was. Where he said, it's not a worm. It's a Nidarian, even though it probably isn't a Nidarian. But even if it is, okay. Yeah. What does that mean for you, then? What do you think that that means? Yeah, this is the thing that really is quite striking about um i'm trying to get my little picture and picture back in here but it's uh, it's very very awkward I, you disappeared sir uh so you're not in the face there let me put you back up in here. oh yeah um, i'm still here at any rate i'll talk and then you you can have the face there uh, the thing that is really frustrating about him is that it's basically a snark about how we can't identify what proper sponges are but yeah. we never get a model of what he thinks happened would it be a problem for intelligent design if it turns out that the um, um, uh, sponges predate uh, well, the Cambrian? Would this be a difficulty for him? I don't know that he really makes a... Uh, ah, there's a picture back. There we go. Um, and this is the thing that's been the case with everything that Beckley does. He's just as vague as Casey Luskin has been uh, uh, in earlier times, and given the fact that uh, Beckley has an actual PhD in paleontology, he has no business doing that. We have no idea what he thinks happened, and yeah. whether or not there is in fact a model. Yeah, if it's like if according to them, all of the all of the um, the actual the metazoans did in fact appear right at the base of the Cambrian, then please tell us what the things in the Precambrian are. And yeah. if they are, and if all the researchers are agreeing that they are animals, like how Tia is a, is a, a, a Nidarian, mm. Dickinsonia is some sort of bilateria morph, then uh, what does that mean for you? Does it, yeah. and it, it doesn't, it doesn't in any way really damage intelligent design because intelligent if, design doesn't really need to have a position here. If all of the Precambrian critters are in fact totally disconnected, as he implies in his paper. Well, they're not, we don't really know that they're metazoans. They might just be protists. Can't we conclude from this that maybe a new designer came on the block in the Cambrian? That the other previous designer had a thing about protistans and they went on with that. Well, this new designer has this thing for biramus appendages and stuff with notochords and things. And so um, uh, besides a, a new designer, why are we assuming that the designer of the Ediacara biota isn't a different designer than the designer of the Cambrian organisms? And for that matter, the, is there any reason to think that the designer of Morella and Claudina is the same designer of Australopithecines and uh, uh, T-Rexes and all of these other things. And there, there's nothing in principle to prevent his mind from going there, except for the fact that he doesn't want to go there. That he wants uh, yeah. a designer, yeah. the designer, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Who happens to be uh, the Christian God, Yahweh, praises me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and more specifically, Jesus, if you right. listen to Bill Dembski, you know, that he's, he's way more than just the generic God of Abraham. Hear that, Jews? It's got to be Jesus. Yeah. So we've got that. It's, oh, you, you remember from my talk with um, with um, Fazal Rana, uh, I brought this issue up and he had no explanation for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and none of them do. Uh, at least um, the uh, old Earth creationists' uh, reasons to believe are kind of openly vacuous. It's the implication that intelligent design isn't that. I do like brain bug. It's just, yes, a group of gods signing up to use the lab and making zany stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so th this is the thing that is so exasperating about uh, any evolutionist in general. Uh, and Beckley as yet another example of it is that, come on, kids, put forward your model. Tell us what you think happened. 
make a clear bit about it. Yeah, I know that would be that would be just that would be just terrible. <laughs> uh, let me let me stop here as well to uh, mention our patrons uh, to get that out of the way, just in case we have a signal uh, issue on there. Uh, our colleagues Hendrel, Colton, Eric Rowley, Suris, and Zeshi. Our researchers uh, Travis Adams, Ian Chan. Uh, convert me, Stephen Early, uh, E. Neal, James Fitzwater, History Minor, Ralph McFadden, Pia, Benjamin Simpson, Speed of Sound, our assistant researchers, Duranku, Trotas Real, Christopher Johnson, our friend level Daniel, Steve Bauman, Marigail Beddows, Insect Cool, Devin Reeves, Martin Nielsen, Paul the Skeptic, Papalopagus, Bo Rasmussen, Alex Stone, Paul Williams, and our legacy patrons who I will insist on uh, thanking even though um, you weren't able to keep uh, at it because of various circumstances, but you helped at some point. Uh, Jen and Jody, Mike, John, Keith, Andrew Dyer, Yui, Mona, Brad, Daniel, Nanya, Stagel, Sun Sky Stone, Ugly German, Trulz, Everett, and Sur. Uh, you've all been helpful. It makes a big difference on there, the capacity to get ink and paper as well as food and pay bills and all the wonderful little things that go along in there. So uh, there we go. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Titan. I won't say your whole name because I don't want to get all the young people in the audience all disturbing about that. Uh, Lisa brings up a point that that instantly is more like millions of years. Yeah, that's the thing that, that really is exasperating and brings back to that map of time issue is that anti-evolutionists have a terrible problem working out what's going on. If you're if you're a young Earth creationist, you're thinking all this stuff is happening like in October of 2350 BC, uh, as the Great Flood is squishing animals around and all that. Uh, so they have a different set of problems. But your old Earth creationists and intelligent designers have this vast vista of time to fill, and they don't turn their brain on to fill it. That, um, mm. th that if you've got a thing of, okay, there's no sponges like 600 million years ago. That's your model? Is that your position? And then somewhere 530 million years ago, this designer, unspecified details, did a design event of unspecified circumstances. If we were to get in the time machine and go back to see the first sponges being made, where were they and what were they and what would we see? Are we seeing sponge parts coming together? Are, are, are we just seeing flash, a whole reef of sponges? What exactly are we seeing as a design event? And is any of that happening today? Did the sponge designer go on vacation and skip uh, town and leave it to the other ones? Or, or their time? Uh, I, I uh, Just as uh, Brainbug thinks about the running lap, I think of the people uh, at a, at a uh, pool hall. And there's your pool game that's going on. And um, a bunch are doing their idiotara biota. And, okay, the bell rings. There we go. You got to go. New kids come in with the games. Clear the decks. Bring out new creatures. Bring out, you know. Except they decided, hey, we're going to keep those Claudina. We're going to keep them. And we're going to keep a few other. Morella. That's going to stick along for a while. You know, get the, the Morella groupies uh, kept Morella going as a little buggy thing all the way into the Ordovician. Uh, but then uh, you got that, uh, hey, would you like to see a really primitive basal chordate? I got one right here. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, meanwhile, yeah, no, 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 we want these arthropods. We want these arthropods. Um, oh, Lisa uh, um, asked, did multicellular organisms start as colonies? Um, you can dive in here as well. I would say that, yeah. That, um, that, sort of. Yeah. Um, they were probably not aggregative colonial critters. They were probably clonal colonial critters. The reason that they would have been clonal, like your all of your cells are clonal. You have the same DNA in all of your cells. Yeah. Um, where can I find more info? Actually, we did a whole video on my channel about that. Um, but uh, <laughs> the reason... Shame you, plug. Um, uh, we did a video, uh, Misunderstanding Multicellularity, in which we talked about the evolution of multicellularity. Um, but the reason it wouldn't ha have been aggregative is aggregative opens up your group to cheaters. So organisms who come in who are fairly similar genetically, but slightly different, who take advantage of the others who are displaying altruism and take over and or take the resources. Whereas if you're a clone, you are all the same or pretty much yeah. the exact same. And there you have the disadvantage 
But now you have, when you finally get the things where sexual reproduction starts coming in, which also relates to the, the connecting of cell walls and all these other kinds of things and, and, and specialized cells. Ooh, uh, uh, Jackson's frozen uh, down in there. I think he may, may have lost his connection. Um, that when you get uh, um, sexual reproduction is a way to shuffle genetic information around more efficiently than uh, a, a clonal production. But you now run the risk of parasites. You run the risk of genetic mutations being a problem. And um, that, oh, okay. there you back. There, you were frozen up there for a second there, Jackson. Um, but at that point, when you've got uh, uh, sexual reproducing organisms, now you are in an arms race between you and your parasites. So a whole mm. bunch of new connections start coming in on that. Now, a lot of this is going on long before we're getting to the Cambrian explosion. And that's one of the reasons why so many of the of researchers on um, uh, the origin of multicellularity and the origin of metazoans are looking at critters that have genes and components and pieces that aren't terribly multicellular a lot-ish, but can have capacities for it, like volvox, uh, the volvocenes that can clump together in interesting ways. And, and it's still unknown how many possible ways to multicellularity there are and whether or not the ones that ended up being the dominant ones won out by natural selection or just by the luck of the draw. Right. And there might have been yeah. other forms, and that's and that's the issue of what those damned Ediacara biota are. That there's things with weird trilateral symmetry that's unlike existing organisms. There's a whole bunch of stuff, and I'd love to I'd love uh, Beckley to put on his thinking cap and to start actually pondering what the hell he thinks is going on. Did did uh, Ediacara biota have homeobox genes, for example? Evolutionists would be going well. If probably. they're in the basal groups of animals, they probably did, but how could yeah. they generate the forms that they do if they do? And that leads to useful predictions as to how you would figure out what kind of combinations and what kind of formal structures would you need genetically. And in principle, Jackson or Jackson's hmm. descendants um, in the future are going to be able to work out um, by paleogenomics uh, a genetic system that could account for what was going on with the Ediacara biota. And it's just a matter of time because uh, you can do the same things but where if you're looking at, uh, at a dinosaur arm, it's got to have a whole network of genetic systems to produce it. And the fact that we know so much about how arms in general are made in vertebrates and we know what's going on in their descendants, the birds, uh, so you can theoretically retro-engineer what the mix needed to be to be able to produce those features physically. And so things are gonna, there's going to be research in that area. Meanwhile, Gunter Beckley, if he lives long enough, will still be collecting arguments as to why something isn't something. And uh, he will probably not be doing... It's not even his area. I mean, he's, he's an insect a systematist uh, by training, and that's what his technical work has been in. But boy, he just feels like diving in on the Precambrian sponges and uh, hominid evolution and anything else that uh, connects up. There was a um, an interview that he had, I think it was uh, either a, someone from Eastern Europe, I think, a young kid, maybe 20 some odd, and he was inviting uh, Beckley on and was interviewing him. And um, what was really unnerving about Beckley is how much like a standard Dwayne Gish style creationist he sounded. For somebody that's not a young earth creationist, he had the same kind of, of pitter patter and, and secondary arguments and even vestigial organs. And he was bringing up a whole bunch of stuff and I'm going, why are you doing this, Gunter? <laughs> well, so, um, I mean, heck, Jonathan Wells and Timothy Standish both do that too. And they're they're about this close from being young earth creationists. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and by the way, uh, in an upcoming episode, um, I've, I've, uh, as I'm researching kind of farther ahead with um, uh, Jensen, Jensen has a little tiny section on vestigial organs in his chapter five. And Surprise. guess where he gets all of his arguments on vestigial organs from? Is it from that AIG chapter we debunked? Uh, just about, yeah. 
because uh, there's some, um, uh, uh, he puts up three main posts, one of which was uh, the Jonathan Sarfati one that we dived into. Oops. Yeah, oopsie. Yeah, so but they, all of it was from Young Earth Creationist Apologetics. He didn't mention Minton, darn it, but uh, maybe the, the time is young. But the, the idea that he would be waving this material, this is the second time he will have waved creationist material. He did it first with the biogeography issue, and he's going to be doing it again with the vestigial. Uh, oh, a pen bag has our chitin cell walls older than cellulose cell walls. That's a really interesting question. I doubt it. I doubt it. Hmm. Yeah, the, well, given the fact that uh, the superstructure of it with cellulose, that's, of course, bringing in plants. And uh, uh, does cellulose show up in algal uh, um, precursors to um, uh, plants? I'm pretty sure. They're, the earliest yeah. um, algae, like Bangiomorpha and Arafatasmia, are like one and a half billion years old, whereas the oldest mm. fungi yeah. are just about one billion years old. Yeah, where chitin pops up in a variety of, uh, I think some of it pops up in some of the mollusks too, isn't it? Uh, insect or arthropods. Yeah, I, I, th I thought a cousin of it. I'm, I'm just looking up in here. Uh, let's see. Chitinozoan bios. Mollusks use, mollusks use calcium carbonate. Ah. Anyway, uh, discovery of a 505 million year old chitin in the basal gummy sponge uh, from 2013. So, yeah, I would, I'd be inclined to think that uh, if we had to wager on it, that um, uh, your uh, cellulose beats them out. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it, interesting. That, 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 oh, go ahead. Um, the, the chitinase enzymes, the, the little enzymes that break down chitin, um, they actually came from, they were developed first in fungi, and then they were horizontally transferred to bacteria, and then bacteria transferred them among each other. Yeah, and they have, a, we mentioned this in a, a, a preparatory for the Shameless Book Plug. Uh, in uh, the rocks were there about the fact that Titan uh, connects up to cholera because the systems that get involved in that Titan uh, uh, um, dissolution uh, and uh, related to that, that, that the bacteria that are involved in, in that reducing Titan are uh, also uh, the causes of cholera. And so a, a creationist at one point decided to argue that it was a good thing that cholera was around as kind of like an ac accidental byproduct because uh, if the bacteria weren't there to eat up all the chitin, the whole ocean would be just filled up with dead mollusk bodies. <laughs> I think there's something to argue with the people. That's, that's uh, quite a position. So Yes, it was one that's, that's definitely a, a position. Anyway... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and that will show you that the extraordinary lengths that people go. Uh, O'Brien oh, Stevens also said chitin also shows up in fungi. Interesting. Yes, yeah. yeah. At, um, fungi and, and arthropods. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, uh, we see the existing organisms that are on the field that have lineages, all of which have the same length of lineage. Every single critter you ever see. And they say, well, when did this come along? Every single organism on the planet has exactly the same length of lineage. They just track through different paths. So we all go back to the last universal common ancestor, regardless of what we are, because that's the last universal common ancestor. Uh, but yet the idea of which components come in in what order and how things get shuffled around and new dynamics occur, that's when you have things in the map of time element. And if you're an anti-evolutionist that doesn't do map of time, like all of them, then it's not easy for them to work out when they think happened applying their models. So uh, that's I'm, uh, I've been really big uh, in all of my work to try to goose everybody to pay close attention to the chronology of things. Because the more you have a sense of the map of time, the farther you are ahead of anti-evolutionists because they don't do that. So that it, it, and it doesn't matter whether they're the young Earth creationist model and and you when dealing with the young Earth creationist you need to be aware of their map of time too, that there's the real map of time with all the pages and all the details, and then there's the little teeny cartoon pamphlet 
that's the young earth creationist map of time, which is a little tiny thin little thing that has very few pages in it and very little data on each page. There we go. We're back on. There we go. Uh, at least we uh, things are correcting. You're moving. Excellent. Uh, let me take this opportunity to set up our shameless plug, which is um, our, uh, our rocks were there, Abert. Let me get that organized in here. Was we are about halfway through the show. That's actually not a bad idea. Uh, let me get uh, to do screen share. Do 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 do. Um, there we go. And put that up there. And um, get our little ad up here. There we go. And uh, zoop. And we will show that. Uh, voila. A wonderful advertisement for The Rocks with Air. A splendid book that Jackson and I have written. We will be doing volume two in due course. We've got... Um, an awful lot of information in there. If you want a book that's funny and technically informative and up to date, we cover it all. Just if, if you think that creationists have any leg to stand on, just, just look into their stuff and you can find what we want um, um, of the information that you can find. Um, there's our reference bibliography runs uh, 100 pages or more in very tiny print involving thousands and thousands of references so it's it's a well uh healed superstructure um volume two we threaten to be as big as volume one and um uh, that's a thing that um will be definitely on our field for uh, we'll have to work out whether or not we'll want the cover uh to be identical to volume one or maybe a slightly varying a rock landscape. We'll uh, we'll work all that little detail. And by the way, of course, you can see right over there. Rocks be there, and the evolution slam dunk. And up there is the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg, uh, my novel uh, that I'm worried on the on the next one of that. Um, the, in addition to the actual content of the rocks, where there is the whole underlying principle of how it's structured, which is Jackson all on his own without any prodding from me came up with a um, approach of, of that I call source methods. And Erica and Dan Stern Cardinale and Dapper Dino and a whole bunch of people, are uh, uh, Colton, all were doing the same format. I've just tagged the name onto it. And, and I'm encouraging everybody to follow up on it, which is follow the sources. That when people make statements, they're offering material for them documentation well does that documentation support their position if they're and what you want to have is a way to measure the reliability of it you can you can go through your entire life and there are creationists who do this standing for truth uh who reads creationist literature and copies down meticulously the science citations that jensen and tompkins have done and then he quotes and regurgitates that material and here some created heterozygosity, ah. and uh, that's as far as it goes. Well, what you need to do is to take the, the fateful step of reading the source material, particularly you want to find um, litmus test areas where uh, if they put a reference up that says the sun rises in the east, um, that's a shocker. Uh, no one's arguing that, uh, or that Abraham Lincoln was president in 1862. Also not an argument, but if they're arguing that Abraham Lincoln was actually a cucumber from Mars, then that's an interesting claim. Let's see what evidence that you can offer for that. Or like the lady that was arguing that there are, are um, uh, uh, teleporting telepathic space spiders on the moon who were holding, I'm not making this up, <laughs> that were holding. No, I've Unfortunately, I believe you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's this wacky lady that, that uh, whether she's a Poe, we don't know. 
uh, apparently she's making some money off of the various videos and stuff and she spews out like 60 videos a week she's just absolutely prolific what? in this yeah yeah she just gets on like for like 10 minutes or so a half an hour uh always in the same clothes uh, and uh, apparently is getting some real, real money that way. Um, but anyway, that if one is making a shocking statement like telepathic space spiders who are holding Sasquatch uh, prisoners in caves, then you want to see the documentation for that. And at that point, if they can, if you can see them documenting something with a technical citation that's done by real scientists in real science journals, because creationists are, uh, and, and a lot of uh, white lunars, um, have a desire to do that. As they say, you don't have to take my word for it. Here's the real science paper that says the thing I want to be true. So here it is. That proves my case. And if it's documenting something which is really wacky, you might have a little antenna going off going, maybe it doesn't say what they think it does. So you need to read the material. Usually, so, almost always. Yeah. yeah. And the thing that I, I discovered this initially with Dwayne Gitch, uh, who is one of the old creationists? Who, I think he's died in 2006, somewhere around in there. But he was the, the big poo of the creationists who did stuff on paleontology, evolution, the uh, the fossils still say no, uh, was his big 1995 book. And um, he, um, uh, it was hard to do source analysis on him back in the 1980s and 90s because the information was so under available in any of the colleges I was around. But it's not 1980s anymore. It's 21st century where we've got internet. Uh, oh, Slade says I had a frustrating conversation with my former pastor about source methods the other day. Ooh, that that uh, maybe should be on sometime and, and discuss that because that could be a rather interesting bit is that when you deal with people that I call the Tortupan minds, they will be really bad at this source methods game that they will read people that say things they want to be true, or they'll see something in the video that says something that they want to be true. And like standing for truth, write down very carefully what the source is and regurgitate it. But they may have zero curiosity to check out whether or not it actually says what they said. I was, before the show came on, I was discussing with Jackson an upcoming project and a, a person who was in a debate with another person um, made an explicit statement that technical paper X made a claim about a particular proposition Y that it explicitly did not do. Yeah. And, when you, and how would you know that unless you read the original paper? So don't take anybody's word for it. That's one of the reasons why I am so adamant about putting direct links in my work and urging everybody else that does stuff to do the same thing, even if it's a matter of putting an image up on the screen so that you can see what the thing is. There's various ways you can do it. Although I'm a stickler, I'm going, listen, I'm the old fart here, but I can figure out how to cut and paste a damn URL link. So you can put that in the video description. This is not rocket science. If old fart RJ can do it, everybody can do it. So uh, you don't need to clutter up your videos with uh, every single source link if you can't get an open access one. But Jackson does that with his videos. You put in the links to the papers so that you can find them. And they're not links to secondary material. They're full text links. And that means that anybody watching the show can follow up. And, and both of us encourage people to do that. Look, first of all, it's fun. You learn shit. You discover so many fascinating things and you get better grounded. You get used to reading the technical literature. You find more material. You may find stuff in the paper where you go, oh, I didn't know that. I, ooh, I'm going to find, I'm going to follow that up. And and you go off on your own journeys. Um, both of us, I am I know this happens to me every bloody day. That's one of the reasons why it's exasperating is I'm researching something and I find a reference to something else in that, and that brings up this, and I need to find out about what that is, and that brings oh, up yeah. that. Whoa, and boy, but that's what happens when you really follow up at that primary source level. And it means that you are gradually grounding your knowledge, and then, again, you want to find a topic that you love, that you don't have to be dragooned. We were discussing this earlier, the fact that there are, there are college professors who may be giving lectures, and they're not their enthusiasm is there to begin with, let alone sharing. <laughs>
And that's that's exactly the opposite. I mean, everybody that watches my show knows if anything, I'm not unenthusiastic about my topics. <laughs> I love them. I'm interested in them. I'm naturally curious about it. Uh, I that uh, like uh, I, I'm hunting rabbits. <laughs> uh, that uh, the the process of of tracking down source material. There's an exhilaration you get when you find the source, and then there's a really big exhilaration when you discover, uh oh, that person has misrepresented that source material. And and that now measures two things. First of all, you now know more about the subject than you did before. And secondly, you have now measured the person who is misrepresenting the source. So then you go, does that raise the probability that maybe other things they've been offering sources for are all misrepresented? Maybe I should look into that too. Or if you know somebody that has a particular interest in that area, you can say, hey, would you like to look into this and see what you can find? And so we've all been getting into this little area and, and it's it's funky because uh, I've, I've spotted this with Erica, I've spotted it with you and I've spotted it with Dapper Dino and various other people is people with particular specialties will notice things that I didn't. And so Dapper Dino is, is way more knowledgeable on uh, the forensics of uh, how you identify a dinosaur, for example. And he was going through raw mat stupid recently, and he was pointing out errors in that argument that I missed because he was looking at it from a different perspective than I was. And so everybody gets into that field that, that you can take advantage of the expertise of others as well as your own. But I will contend this, anybody that believes something that isn't true is screwing up at the source methods level. This is how they get to that. You can't get to a faulty conclusion that bad without having a bad source method. So if you come in from that basement and start poking around, sweeping the cobwebs away, you know, stomping this little spiders that get into there, turning on the flashlight, looking at the undercarriage beams, and you start finding out that, uh-oh, there's no argument here, or that the sources, however many references they had, they're not presenting them accurately. There you get into trouble. And it also means that you hopefully are learning the practices of sound method yourself and abiding by them. So you make sure that you're reading primary source material as much as possible. If you're reading a secondary account on a website, always have a flag that's a secondary account that you don't really know it for sure. You have only have a secondary account telling you about it. Maybe you should check to see whether or not their primary source is valid. Uh, I, I bump into this in, in all sorts of areas in politics uh, where people are talking about uh, proposals that are being made uh, about what things can be done in Congress and what things can be done in the economy. It's exactly the same method as hunting down sources in the scientific community. And ultimately, if people are making dumb things like Rand Paul, I'm getting political here, Rand Paul, who is a scientific illiterate and a Trump defender, who when asked point blank on um, the uh, uh, CBA, or ABC um, George Stephanopoulos thing on the weekend, uh, can you not admit that there was no stolen election, that the election was not stolen? And you're just seeing that Tortugan mind shell at work. And you could practically see the, the, the moment of, well, uh, yeah, and he could not say that. He would go, well, there are problems with the election, but not enough to do that. You just can't do that. Well, that's the Tortugan mindset. Except oh, there are problems. The problem is you lost. Yeah. And and he, he would go off on deflections where he would be saying that um, they're, they're calling the Republicans liars. No, no, Rand. We're calling them Tortukan idiots. That's not the same thing. <laughs> that these are people who have bad method. And he has bad method. He's an anti-vaxxer. He was complaining about the uh, uh, COVID-19. I mean, he's a nincompoop. And uh, he's a disgrace that he's in the Senate. But at the very least, um, uh, everybody should be asking people questions and source method questions about these things because it, now it actually matters. It's the difference between getting the handle on a virus. It's the difference between having people who are not inciting sedition um, in positions of power. These are not trivial details, gang. 
<laughs> and, and I, I take umbrage. I, sir, I take umbrage at the idea of seditionists waving the Confederate flag around in my Capitol building, I must say. <laughs> yeah, the Confederates never got to Washington, D.C. So. Mm. Oh, Lisa brings up a very good point here. And here's where some of the tricks of the trade come in. Sometimes you can't find the primary source. That's true. There are occasions where you discover that you cannot locate the actual technical literature, but there are ways to end run around it. For example, if a topic is an area where there is other technical literature, they may be discussing that same technical point that you can't find the primary source for. So, for example, if you find that Schmidlap paper is citing that Jones paper, and they are discussing the context of it, and it's clear from Schmidlap that Jones is not saying what the person who cited it earlier implied it did. That's an, a way around the matter. You can find some various, you can find out what other works the person has done, especially if after the work in question, find out what their position is now. So if their position now is clearly not what the person citing the paper implied it was, and it raises the probability that they were misrepresenting that primary source. Another way is have the network of people who may be able to get the paper for you and don't be afraid to contact the author of the paper if they're still alive. So they've got emails probably in the technical uh, literature on there or there is a contact author, email them and ask them for the paper. And the, the, the odds are that you'll be able to get some real, uh, a PDF and that from it that way. So there's a variety of ways to end run around this stuff. Don't give up. RJ, uh, it's, no. I think we can provide a, um, a an example, uh, or a recent example that the both of us bumped into in which we cannot find the primary source, but we don't really mm -hmm. need to. Um, yeah. Well, re with reference to uh, Otangelo's blog post on speciation, where he cites Wells citing uh, Alan Linton on saying yeah. bacterial speciation has never occurred. Well, we can't actually get to the article that the quote is from because it was written in some journal or whatever. And never that, put online. Yeah, that was never put online. So, But that doesn't mean Linton hasn't done stuff since and that there are other people relating to it. And so there's right. various there's various ways around the end game. Uh, the, another one, if, if, if you do hit a dry well where you just can't get to it, you can put it on the look into later thing and see if you go to the next point. And so uh, if you discover, for example, as I did with Dwayne Gish, that in every single instance when I could get the primary source, I discovered that he's misrepresented the primary source. Do you think that makes you more suspicious about the reliability of the ones that you can't get to? Do you think suddenly Dwayne Gish put on his brilliant hat and became absolutely perfect and, and was utterly scrupulously fair with the papers this time, only when you can't actually see the primary source available, whereas he was had his head up his ass and was misrepresenting and, and leaving out relevant information in every other instance that you can find. No, 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 no. If you have a bad method in one area, you're probably going to be a bad method in another. So we've seen that with Georgia Purdom. We've seen it with Andrew Snelling. We've seen it with uh, uh, David Metton. Uh, that um, there is a, a, a the wood morap. There's a whole consistency of behavior that if you show that you have a bad way with methodology, it's probably going to be showing up all the time. And uh, um, oh, uh, Lisa says she has a Discord. I, I have Discord as well, but I haven't really made use of it as well. Everybody's got their own particular uh, venues. It's, it's largely a gamer's platform that I've seen. And so there's a lot of ways that people go on when they do that. Uh, they can easily communicate back and forth while they're doing their games and that. But I'm not a gamer, so it's not really a big important um, uh, detail with me. But anyway, there are, so there's a various ways around um, the bit. We've got uh, when trying to find a technical paper. Um, one of the tricks is to Google the title, not merely uh, um, to look up uh, the original work and see who cited it and whether or not it's open access at the journal where it's published, but Google the title to see whether or not somebody's put up a post of it, uh, the technical paper that. Uh, 
frequently there are science articles that are not available free at science but college courses post the thing and so you actually have it available somewhere or some various environments uh, will have the material available or it ends up uh, the author of the paper posts it on academia edu or a research gate that sort of thing there's a bunch of different ways around it as somebody that is not made of money knows full well uh that um uh, every article that i can get in a free pdf is one article i'm not going to pay money for because i'm not going to pay money for an article thank you <laughs> yeah I no, not i'm not going to pay i'm not going to pay a hundred dollars for a nature article sorry yeah yeah and uh, so there's ways around that um the one area that, that dan stern cardinale has brought up which is really important though and why seeing the full text is relevant is because although you get a lot in the summary in the abstract, the place where often the neat stuff is, is in the discussion at the end of the article, after all yes. the methods and all of that. And if you don't have the full text of the article, you don't get that. So that, 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 that especially when you're researching very isolated points about particular fossils or the little skivvy details of a biological system or genetics, uh, it's in that discussion section things that didn't make it into the, the, the formal abstract, uh, that's where you can really find out what's going on. Uh, Brian Stevens has put up some academic uh, uh, material. Uh, I think this is a brain bug having web issues up the wazoo, so we can't open it. Yeah, uh, that's another matter of, of sometimes um, your browser may not work in a particular point. That's why it's great to build up a network of people that if one person can get a hold of it, well, they can email the thing to you. And or link it to you in some context on Twitter, which we change, we exchange information back and forth all the time that way. Um, it, it's even trickier when dealing with books because there are some topics where you need to see the book involved. Another variable to remember is the age of the work. If in the case of creationism, Jackson knows as well that the odds that a work that's older than you are is one of the cutting edge works in the field <laughs> um, is remote. So the older it is, the less panic stricken you should get into as to whether or not you can find it. Now, from my point of view, as a, as a historian and a scholar who likes those little fiddly bits, sometimes looking at how somebody deals with older material is very useful because it really as a, the vestigial organ issue and mitten, uh, it involved a bunch of tropes that float around in the creationist literature and it turned out an awful lot of Mitten's argument built off of his misreading of an 1890s textbook and it turned out boy was he misreading that 1890s textbook <laughs> and you wouldn't have known that if you didn't have the thing i didn't have to pay a dime for the damn thing it was available open access at uh, Project Gutenberg or one of those uh, operations. And so there's just lots and lots of ways around. So don't give up, poke around, check around with people and all of that. Uh, it's uh, it's a delightful thing. Um, so JSTOR, uh, Lisa I mentioned JSTOR is temporarily given open access. Yeah, there's a bunch of different routes with JSTOR. Um, there's ones where you, you can gain access like uh, uh, without a collegiate connection and you can read three articles a month or something like that, uh, freebies uh, and that way. And back in the days before so much else was accessible online, uh, that was actually a useful point. So I would bide my time and wait and get onto JSTOR and get the little thing done up and download the pages. Oh, there's other varieties that you can do. For example, there are ways where the article itself is not directly accessible, but the images are. And you can literally save each page as PDF images and mm. put them in a Word document and save that and put, and run. There's lots of different ways to maneuver around. It, it, there's, there's, there's sneaky ways. It's like, uh, and plus it keeps um, uh, you on the ball in terms of, uh, of uh, activity. Now, books um, get into a very different area because um, a, a lot of the research that... Um, I get into it in, uh, on my own, and Jackson and I will be getting into as a team relating to stuff on the origin of religion and cultural history and stuff. A lot of that is booked, and that's a trickier enterprise to go into. Now, if you happen to be lucky enough to live in a town with college libraries, 
that may help you in many ways. You may find um, that there's accessibility. I, for example, had to find at one point, um, uh, there, there was a claim that a 19th century Bible believer made that the Gospel of Luke um, that has um, supposedly Mary's genealogy rather than Joseph's genealogy, that the Babylonian tractate um, of the Hebrew uh, culture actually mentioned this in one of their Babylonian things, that the, that, that the Luke genealogy was that of Mary. It seemed an odd topic for a Jewish text to be talking about right off the bat. Well, da dee da Gonzaga University here in Spokane has a gigantic Judaica section. And so I was able to track down the Babylonian tractate and discovered, no, it doesn't say that at all. <laughs> and so the two people who were offering this argument online were both copying the same 19th century writer that had made this idea up back in the 1880s or somewhere and that neither one of them apparently had ever thought to check the original source. Oopsie. Surprise. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, Brainbug, don't you miss the uh, days of old fashioned sleuthing through papers like an ancient scribe? No, I don't. <laughs> that doesn't sound fun, no. Oh, boy. Think about, think about the daunting thing. Anybody that has been in a college library stack, okay? You go down and you locate where the science magazine row is. And now you go, okay, there you go. Find out all the articles in science magazine on the subject of um, asparagus. Uh, what are you going to do? Open up volume one, look through each tank, can't find out. That's the level of complexity because you had no way of searching things. Now, if you had somebody citing the science paper on asparagus, then at least you'd know where to go. But how would you know who wrote an article two months later criticizing the asparagus article? Or that 10 years later would be the pivotal work on asparagus published in a completely different journal that you aren't looking at because you're in the science world. So this, this was just a pain in the ass. Plus, if I wanted a copy of said article, I would go and I would take the thing out from the shelf and bring it to the photocopier and go chink, chink, chink. And pretty soon I have spent a lot of money on the 20 page article to be able to get the whole schmear. And that's just one little article. And I still don't know about anything else in the field. No, 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 uh, a brain bug. I do not pine for the days of, of furrowing through the stacks uh, anymore. I love the accessibility of electronics to where I can download papers and cross-reference things and do searches for texts and do all the kind of stuff. Uh, it it's accelerates the capacity to do research in such a blinding way. Jackson, you've never lived in this world. You've lived in, in, in an electronic world from the get-go. So don't ever go back to that. <laughs> Stay in the modern world. Yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely delightful. I'm like a kid in a candy store with the, the degree of accessibility to information, plus the fact that I can, I can guarantee you, Jackson and I could not have written The Rocks Were There at the depth that we were able to do if we didn't have access to all of that stuff electronically. It would be impossible to do. I mean, some of this stuff, we I doubt we could we could find like in a library, like the that 1915 oh, yeah. paper on coral reef formation. Who the hell would have that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. a lot of this stuff, uh, even, even in my own environment, um, uh, if I wanted to get an article from Nature, I had to go to one of the college libraries. Our Spokane Public Library carries science, but not nature. And so I would have to go to Gonzaga, or in other cases, I would have to go all the way out to Eastern. And, and paleontology, I was screwed because none of the colleges here have major paleontology departments. Therefore, they aren't carrying the journals, at least in the old days. Now, um, if you're a student of the school, it doesn't matter whether you're 
uh, college carries that journal, you have access to all of that electronically as a student. Yep. So it's it's a totally different ballpark. Although even there, look at when you bumped in to try to find that damn article on pro Archeo, um, um, uh, a proto proto Avis. Proto Avis, yeah. That, that wasn't available because it was like short bits, so it wasn't accessible. Mm -hmm. I knew about it, and I had already looked it up and yeah. photocopied it physically. I had a physical hard copy of it. So there, are, there are other things. The other thing that I, I call attention to regarding electronics is there is a side issue, is that people, what can be posted online can be deleted from online. So if somebody puts up, like Raw Matt was putting up his stupid creationist paper, and then when he was getting in trouble for it, started revising it, they, and altering it, and then get and then pulled it. They not a single word of that was left untouched, and that's the funniest part of all. Not a single word was untouched. It was he, he made more revisions to that thing in shorter time than Ken Holden has his doctoral dissertation. I mean, like Dan and Walking Fish and Dapper and Erica, they just went through it and crossed everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And and I I had, uh, I went at it as well from my direction because I was looking up some of the uh, the genetic material that was going on, and um, in between the three of us, we're all able to locate the primary sources literally within hours. It was that mm -hmm. accessible of stuff, and that would have not been possible in the modern era. But anyway, if something is put online and you go, this is shit, make a copy of it and preserve it on your files. So that if they decide to eliminate it, uh oh, we have to copy. Thank you very much, because that's what happened with with uh, Krieger and his stupid attack on the um, Catherine Hunt's uh, talk origins piece, which I go into in great great detail in the uh, Evolution Slam Dunk. Uh, that mm -hmm. Krieger had done a piece on this in two thousand three, I think, uh, that was had his name on it on a website. And then later on, he edited it and revised it, took his name off it. And so it was anonymously posted in 2008 at Creation Ministries International. Well, because I had the hard copy of the original version, I and knew this was Krieger's work. Yeah. And Creation Wiki, and, yeah. Yeah. And so I could cross-reference the two and see how he evolved in misrepresenting things from one version to the next version of it, in addition to... Our famous mouse. <laughs> oh, yeah, where he says Oligokyphus and uh, Hadracodium were just mice, just even mice. though they don't have either the jaw or the ear of mice, like at all. Yeah. And, and, and what's worse, this was patently obvious from the text of Kathleen Hunt's actual material which I mean, he somehow conveniently edits out mice are more closely related to the duck-billed platypus than either of them are to hadracodium yeah that's how different yeah. they are yeah so there's there's advantages to having hard copy for internet material or the ability to generate hard copy so um if uh, one of the tricks that i've learned is to create a secondary uh, HTML, well, effectively word processor documents. So I have many documents where I may have lots of stuff printed up, just like the stuff here. Um, oh, uh, the, the, the sophisticated Neanderthal, which has popped up um, uh, it's, um, uh, just from January of 2020. It's not available as a PDF. I don't care because I, the version you're seeing here is not the print version of simply hitting print on the thing. No, I copy the text off the screen, I paste it into a Word document, which I then save as a Word document. So I've got this, uh, this is page 215 of uh, the uh, 2021 active doc file. <laughs> and so I know where to find it and all that. So I don't even necessarily have to print out the whole shebang, but it also means that I can copy and paste text. And if I'm looking up particular, I, I can keep references for the, uh, because we put in the links um, uh, complete for the references of stuff. Um, uh, I, I put that in with red so I can easily copy all of These are all the tricks of the trades of the scholars.
it does in order to be able to manage the information flow so that you can keep track of stuff. And arguably, you can triage. The stupider it is, the more likely the creationists might eventually want to pretend they never said it. So uh, and now it's different if it's something that is in their regular journals. Uh, that functionally becomes an archive. And so the odds are that that stuff is going to be still available even after it's become stupid. Um, uh, uh, Creation Ministries International still has the chat thing where they were discussing the ballistic koalas <laughs> back um, in 2008. I managed to find, what was it, the Creation Research Science Quarterly or whatever? Um, mm -hmm. I managed to find uh, uh, Wood Morap's one piece on index fossils from the 80s, I think. Yeah. And that's it. That's That one paper is the only paper on index fossils in all of creationdom. That one. Boy, that shows you their interest in that topic, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, the, the, that's a, that's relates to another issue, which is the dog not barking in the night, if you're familiar with Sherlock Holmes, that um, errors of omission are way more common in stupid people and Tortukans than errors of commission, where the, where the creationist actually makes a technical mistake. No, most of their big problems are from what they leave out. That, so they're not technically saying an incorrect thing. They're just neglecting to mention the correct thing. They leave all of that stuff out. And, and so if you're leaving out data field, which they are on a colossal scale, then that too becomes an area. And that's, that's a much more laborious procedure to deal with. It's very easy uh, or comparatively easy to research where the creationist says dumb things like the space spiders. Um, uh, it's another thing to note where what the stuff they're leaving out. So um, uh, Andrew Snelling and geology, a lot of that involves um, the technical matters that they are bypassing. So there is a much more fine-tuned skill set of seeing where they're getting close to it. That's one where, where knowing the source base can be so relevant. For example, um, a particular kind of rock formation is a really big problem for creationism. And it's discussed in the technical paper that Snelling cited but neglected to mention that detail. Uh-oh. Which means you know he had to have known about it. Or even worse, the, uh, another one, always pay attention to the ellipsis. Oh, the glorious ellipsis, the dot, dot, dot. That's one of the, the, the wonders of, of, uh, of scholarship. That when somebody has a, particularly if it's a long quote, it's, it's a different matter if it's a short quote. You've got a line here and a dot, 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 another line here. Sometimes there's juicy stuff in between. But if somebody's got a really long quotation and there's still a dot, dot, dot in the middle, why is there a dot, dot, dot? They, this is a long quote. Why are they leaving that out? Sometimes they're leaving out the references, and there are times when, when we find out what they referenced and read what those references said, we discover the stuff that they left out. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's there's umpteen different routes to it. It's, it's a hunting procedure that uh, um, uh, you can put as much effort into as you like, but this demonstrates you don't have to spend money to do it, that you can do these things uh, uh, without a great. Uh, and in fact, I don't, don't, don't buy creationist books. Don't give them money. I just don't, I don't encourage them. <laughs> Ideally, find out somebody like a kind person that, that, that gave me this book. Uh -huh. And that, that's so much nicer. And that way, uh, um, there was only the one waste of money of buying the original work, and, and then it gets passed on to me. Uh, that's another way of doing it. Uh, but uh, the more that you can be aware of the opponent's position, the better it is. So in any area of creationism, we're past the hour, and so we'll probably be pulling a thing in the same. But got some questions. Hi, David Neff. Yes, we've been following your stuff on there as well. Um, Everybody, everybody's got their own channels. Everybody make a point of subscribing. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you get little notifications really easy peasy. So it makes it really easy to kind of triage stuff. And I usually start piling up a whole bunch of videos. Oh, I gotta watch that, gotta watch that, gotta watch that. And so sometimes 
I'm looking at a, a video a year after it came out because I have too many other things on the thing. But at least you can put the little URL in the little Word document on that. Um, anyway, um, find areas of special interest that you enjoy. Connect up with people. Have fun at it. Um, and uh, um, focus in to recognize what the creationists argue. Always play fair with what they claim. Don't try to ram them into an area. I, I'm rather annoyed at some critics of, of creationism that try to lump too much, you know, where they, they, they bump into some intelligent design advocate and they're trying to bring up the flood. Uh, sorry, this is not their area. No, no. Find what the stupid stuff that they have written on, not somebody else's stupid stuff. Uh, and uh, then also, uh, I think uh, hopefully Jackson in interacting with this old fart will recognize how much of a long history there is to the creationist field. It fizzled out. Some of it starts trickling out in the 1930s and earlier. Uh, but that stuff is, we're still living with the legacies of that, that we, uh, Jackson would be encountering arguments being put out in the 21st century that are the same ones that were being thrown out in the scopes trial in the 1920s. And um, so there's only a limited number of areas to fiddle with. The other thing is to keep, uh, unless you're super anal retentive and have an unbelievable time on your hands, you might want to just triage and say I have a particular person or area that you pay attention to. So I, for example, keep track of what happens at AIG and to some extent ICR because I get their stuff directly. So they're self-advertising. They send you the material you put on their mailing list. The Discovery Institute sends you their little announcements saying, this is important. We think this is important. And so that allows you to save time on things. You may They also may not be calling attention to stuff that, that you may encounter from other directions, but that's an area. So everybody can work out um, a final bit. Uh, uh, do you have anything final to say? Uh, buy our book. Buy our book. I can agree to that totally. Buy the rocks were there. While you're at it, buy Evolution Slam Dunk. Uh, give them, buy a bunch of them, and give them out as party favors. Uh, uh, give them as a donation to your library if they don't have that. That's a possibility, as well. Uh, let anybody that knows about it need to know about it, and so forth and so on. And once you have the book, make a point of, of writing a review and so forth. So I think we've. Um, Oh, James, uh, David says, uh, um, I've almost finished re uh, reading your book. I'd love to get you on my channel to talk about it. I have no problem on that, little puppy. Uh, Jackson and I would be delightful to be on talking about it because that's a, a way to explain what we were going about and where we're going with it in the future and so forth and so on. So set it up, Buster. Uh, we are ready to go on that. So uh, thanks, Jackson, for being here uh, again this week. It's you're, you're always super welcome because uh, as much as I love to hear myself uh, talk, I also enjoy other people talking and, and allows me to, 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 to breathe occasionally. I know some people may wonder whether or not I'm, I actually breathe or not, but I do. Well, you know, insects breathe with little uh, sphericals on the sides of their body. Uh -huh. So if ah, could, well, that's what those are for. Oh, okay. I was wondering about that. I mean, RJ, then you wouldn't have to take a breath. You could just have your little spherical breathe. True. You want to talk, you know? That's true. And I, I might have a career in Congress too. At any rate. So um, uh, uh, that finishes up the show for tonight and we will see you uh, next week. Uh, everybody stay safe because we still got the, uh, the COVID crap to worry about. And, um, um, Catch you all in the next time. Um, uh, don't accept any wooden penguins and keep investigating stuff because the universe is interesting. Okay, see you the next week.